So if you go through this quote, through this paragraph, you will see that there are many abstractions actually used. Although we think that's in our perception, this is something very concrete. We all know about uh, this, this money label value. We have an idea, but we can only understand what is behind it when we go back. And this is one thing for today's society, if we go back to the question of commodities. Commodities are one of the central categories we have to look at in economics. So, again, the economists of the 17th century begin with a living home, meaning this is what we immediately see, where we have an impression. Now, the letter is obviously the scientifically correct method. The concrete is concrete because it is the concentration of many determinations, hence unity of the diverse. It appears in the process of thinking, therefore, as a process of concentration, as a result, not as a point of departure, even though it is the point of departure in reality, and hence also the point of departure for observation and conception. So this is the important point. We have to deal as well with contradictions. Whatever we analyze in concrete terms is a matter of contradictions. Without these contradictions, it doesn't exist. Now, there are different kinds of contradictions, different kinds as well in terms of gravity, if you want. What is their meaning? If you contradict your parents or your girl and boyfriend, I don't want to get up and, and go to the seminar uh, because they try to chase you. This is a small minor thing. If you contradict the entire system of third level education, this is a more severe thing. And then, of course, there are these severe conflicts between different social groups and classes. So we have to think, A, we are dealing with contradictions, and B, what is the, co the character, the meaning of these contradictions? It is only against this background that we understand, or that we can understand, what economics is about. As said, economics is not economy. Economics is a scientific discipline, an academic discipline, with a specific subject matter. From all these impressions and perceptions we have, and we may have, we take some, select some, and say this is relevant for us. It does not mean the others don't exist. It doesn't even mean the others are not relevant. But we are concentrating on one, uh, uh, one aspect. And there you can see already the relevance of what I said before. We are abstracting. We are looking only at certain aspects of the, of the entirety that are relevant for us as economists. We are not looking at the legal details of a contract of differential powers in contracts. We say the contract is a legal principle we accept, free agreement or agreement by free individuals, and then you have the different factors. 
We leave the other stuff for, for legislators, for jurists. Discipline, subject matter means as well discipline, in terms of we are disciplining ourselves and we are accepting that we are disciplined and that we fade out certain things. We are not allowed to think. And then there comes a very sad thing. We are not allowed to think too much about inequality, injustice. This is a major problem actually for economics. To accept certain ways of discipline, to know this is not just, or this is just in economic terms, and we fade out the moral part. Adam Smith, as I said, founding father, one of the founding fathers of economics, wrote quite a lot, but two major works. The one was Moral Sentiments, and the other was The Wealth of the Nation. There are different thoughts, different considerations about it. My point of view is he was not able to combine it. He kind of explicitly said, talking about the wealth of the nation is not compatible with talking about morals. So I do it in two different books. I'm here economist, I think about wealth, and here I think about moral sentiments and moral philosophy. Now, saying it this way, of course we have in economics many considerations that they say explicitly, yes, we are economists, and as such, we have to think about inequality. In which way do economic processes actually cause or undermine the emergence of inequality? But usually these economists have difficulties in the discipline. They may even have good reputation and have a high standing, but in many cases, especially what you read in the old textbook, this doesn't think much about these things. This says, yes, there is something, but we are not dealing with it. So it is determining the subject matter. And I said commodities with their use value and exchange values and labor are central categories here. And we have disciplines as well in the terms of disciplining our thinking. Don't think outside of the box. As I said, at some stage, economics can be more or less reduced on something like this. It's amazing how often you see this figure when it comes up, you read economics. It's just a variation of this. You may have two lines here, you may have two lines here, you have the important points wherever, but it's all a variation of this. Meaning, everything here is left out, abstract from it. Don't think about it. There are certain criteria we use. We think they are important to define what we should achieve with studying with scientific work in economics. They are to some extent just for economics. In many cases they are relevant for any kind of discipline. We want to some extent predict something. 
We analyze something today or in the past to say this is what is going to happen tomorrow or in 100 years. Because it is needed, it's necessary for practice. Measurability. We want to measure something. It's not about I think it is, I like, I don't like, but we want to have something that we consider if it is right or not is another question, but that we consider is measurable, it's objective. The height of this desk is measurable. It doesn't matter if it's too high for me to jump over it. It is just a certain height. I can put a figure on it. Consensuality. Even in such simple thing, consensuality matters. There was a major change actually in this consensus in when I lived in Europe, in, in Ireland. The European Union obliged all countries to measure distances in kilometer and um, meter. In Ireland, we used miles and feet and this. So the European Union said, no, from this and that date, you use kilometer. And this was at least the legal consensus. From now on, we need, we have to skip the miles and we have to change the kilometers, which was good for the industry producing signs for traffic signs and distance signs. They had to change everything. So in some places in Ireland, for instance, you find still the old sign in miles, distance in miles to this and that place, and then you find the new one in kilometer. Rationality. Rationality, a rationale, means we define our interests, and according to this interest, we define what fits into this framework. All what is on these lines fits into the framework. What is outside and what is here doesn't fit. This is about rationality. Objectivity, closely linked to measurability. It is something where we can objectively state it is agreed by everybody, consensuality, it's measurable, and it is objectively true. Means it does not matter under which conditions things happen. Now there is always as well here even a problem that the point water reaches the temperature of boiling is different under certain conditions, air pressure and stuff. But objectively, we can define the conditions under which this is true. And then I mentioned it in a different context, we have comparability. We want to be able to compare things and these things are the abstractions in different contexts. If this is not possible, we say basically it is not scientific. If we are not able to compare things, to determine the points that are relevant, then it is not scientific then it is not because it is not comparable. This is the framework. As I said, to some extent it is valid for all disciplines. And in many cases you can actually say, especially in natural science, there are many of them, they are very clear. Objectively, things fall down under certain conditions, but objectively they fall down and they fall down 
in a straight line. Now the straight line is again something after latest, after Einstein, we know it's not really straight, it's bent. But at least we have exact parameters that allow us to determine what is happening. If we have a law in economics and say demand and supply depend on each other, then we are, of course, more into trouble because we don't know exactly all the parameters that determine demand and that determine supply. It may be that we are right in a certain narrow context, but supply depends not only on demand, of course, but it depends as well on the availability of raw material. So you may want as many cars as you want if there is no rubber coming into China alone to, uh, to produce tires, you will be in trouble. There are four core issues in economics we use. And this is now very much bringing things onto one or onto four points abstracting from others and say these are four issues that are defining to a large extent what we are dealing with in economics. All contestable. But this is what we work with, scarcity. If we have enough, economics doesn't deal with it. Economics is about the distribution of scarce products. The commons, you may remember the, the little clip I showed you. This is typical where products are scarce, meaning not products, but land, the grassland is scarce. We do not have enough grass for everybody according to what they want. So we have to think about now how to distribute it or how is it distributed. This is not necessarily by a market, but we have to think about it. There are more sheep than this grassland can feed. How to deal with this situation? If we would be able to say, well, if there are more sheep, there is more grass, fine. We would not be interested in this in economics. So in consequence, we have to choose. We have alternatives. We can say, simply kill the sheep that we cannot feed. Set for the sheep, set for the owner, but this solves one of our problems. We can say as well, killing these poor animals is not good, so put all the animals on a diet. It's okay for them if they get a little bit less grass. They will survive and they will be well able to survive, but then it's for all. And then incentives matter. What do we get actually out of our choices? And there you see how much interests play a role. Any action in economics or in the economy is based on, on choice, but as well on our choice, what do we want to gain? The typical example used here is what do you gain out of studying? That's your choice. What is the incentive? Meaning you expect something coming out after four years that you value more than taking up a job, than doing nothing, or than studying biology. And there you have then the comparison. 
you compare the different alternatives, you choose according to your utility function, according to what you want to achieve. So simple is economics. This is what we say in the Euro textbook, kind of explaining everything that we are dealing with in economics. Then there are the small ongoing questions, of course, what determines scarcity, what determines need, how do we produce things, or is it just a matter of the market, of exchange? But these are the four basic principles we in economics deal with. Anything else comes after that is derived if you want. Derived, not deducted. In order to be able to do so, to be able to work in this framework, scientific framework, especially in economics, we deal with models. It's the most important thing to understand models. I don't want to go into the general idea of models, but link it immediately to the market model. There you have this generalization again. One problem, one solution fits all. We are not interested in individual cases. But we say this is the general way things work. Then we come to something we talked about in the context of, of law, of this revolution, bourgeois revolution. All acts of exchange are equal to each other. Equality is the fundamental principle. And all markets are the same. Now, this is absurd. The, the market for rice and the market for Lamborghini, they are the same in our thinking. Now, if you have a little bit of, of common sense, you will know immediately there is a, a huge difference between buying rice and buying a Lamborghini. There is a huge difference even between buying groceries and buying clothes and buying furniture. But this is something we abstract from. We don't consider the details. We just say one problem, one solution, this fits all. By rice, by Lamborghini, it doesn't matter. We deal with it. And we can deal with it today, tomorrow, in 100 years. Because this is the assumption the market model will be valid in 100 years as well. And this is the paradox, even if we are not interested in individuals, we always consider the individual act, the act of the individual as being the most relevant. As I said, we are dealing with contradictions. You have to get it, you have to accept it, you have to question it, but in economics we do not question it, we just say this is the way it works. Rationality, we talked about it, it's rational behavior in terms of utility functions, in terms of producing and consuming, exchanging commodities. Individuals as consumers. This is the core idea of this individual act. We are consumers. Whatever else happens outside of consumption 
doesn't fit on these lines and is not interested for us, interesting for us. Even if you are a producer, you have an enterprise, you produce machines, you are a consumer, because everybody has to be a consumer and everybody will be at some stage a consumer. Equality, I mentioned it in an earlier lecture. It doesn't matter if two people interact or if one billion people interact. Principle of equality is considered to be the main and only guideline. This idea of complete information I know everything, and I know everything includes, I know what is going on tomorrow and next year and in a hundred years. And then you have the irrationality of rationality of economics. We assume that the development in hundred years will determine our, real, uh, our behavior today. If we know something is Cheaper in 100 years, we won't buy it today because we wait 100 years. So good luck with the waiting, I buy it today. It's not rational in economics, but again, we have this, um, this contradiction. This contradiction is this one continuum of markets in terms of matter, space, and uh, time. You cannot easily go to uh, to, to Beijing and say, well, things are cheaper there. There are many things playing a role, but for us, not. For us, we consider this as one market, a continuum of markets. And then you are free. It's absolutely at your decision to join and buy a Lamborghini. And I assume most of you at least decided not to buy a Lamborghini. Now the question is, how many people decided not to buy rice? And how many people could actually decide freely, I don't enter this market of rice? Or even more so, I don't buy my food. How many people had been free to decide, I don't want to join this market? Maybe a few could step out to a little bit, having a garden, having your own bedroom, growing your own vegetables. If this is sufficient is another question, but at least there's a little bit stepping out. You don't have to buy all your clothes. You can buy, and then you are in the market, you can buy raw material and uh, produce your own clothes. So this freedom is a little bit tricky. And all demanders are immediate consumers, all suppliers are immediate producers, and everybody can immediately change position. Meaning, Actually, you can leave, you open an enterprise, and the afternoon you are producing machines. That's the idea of the model. This is what the model suggests, that's what we can supposedly do. As I said, it's tremendously important that we always work with reference to this model, or to this model. And try to understand this contradiction and paradox. We are not looking at individuals, and at the same time we are looking at individuals. It's only the individual act that counts. The individual looking at his, her own advantage. It's not society looking at society's advantage. 
This is the problem of the commons. It's the contradiction we see there as economists. We say grasslands or grass is scarce. There are more sheep needing this grass than we have grass. How to deal with this situation? In the market model, we say everybody is looking at his or her own advantage, gain. I, my sheep, should have as much grass as possible. Now there is this competition. And this is something where, in a way, we don't have a solution in economics. The solution is only a few people will get the drugs, only a, sheep, uh, a few people will survive. Now, if you look at the entire commons discussion, and if you look a little bit at what we did, you see there is another alternative. We can say, it's fair enough, you want to have grass for 20 sheep, you want to have for 20 sheep, and you want to have for 20 sheep, and you want to have for 25. And then we do the calculations and say, there is enough for 20 plus 20 plus 20 plus 20, but not for 20 plus 20 plus 20 plus 25. So there's something with your five sheep we have to deal with. Get them to another ground, or we find a solution that we distribute the grass that is there to feed all sheep. But then, of course, Incentives matter. They say, why should he have 25 sheep, having all sheep well fed, on the cost of our sheep? So at the end of the day, it's not about how much does every sheep get, but how much do you get in total. So we find a solution there. an agreement, and we could actually say, well, you have 20 sheep, can bring them, but not one more. Or we find a solution that we say, okay, these animals have to survive, and there is no other way than this grassland. But the gain you, the additional gain you have from your five sheep, you should not have it privately, but we will distribute this for the loss we have. Because if these 60 sheep get less food, the gain will be lower. So you gain more, they gain less. What justifies that you gain more? So pass on some of your additional gain. But this, of course, requires negotiation, requires separate negotiation that not, does not work to the law of the jungle. Because the law of the jungle or the law of the market would say, you are stronger. You have already five sheep, and you can basically push them out of the market, push them out of the grassland. They have less, and you will still gain more. So then you can come up with simple calculations. Even if your individual sheep gets less, you get in total more, which means you are stronger in comparison to the position of these two. Models are important in exactly this aspect or this perspective. We try to deal with the situation that is full of contradictions and tensions. 
And as we are not really able to deal with it, it's a political decision, it's a decision of communication, we say we reduce it, we only look at the mechanism of price, how much do you pay for your 25, how much do you pay for 20? Get the best price out of it, it's my grassland, it's not our grassland, and then we get a deal. This is the model, because you can always say, I don't join. It's my free decision to enter this league. And I said, it's not really this free decision, but it is a limited freedom. If you have alternatives, comparative advantage, if you have a choice, you can feed them something else, you have another commons, then the situation is different. So you see there's always as well power playing a role even if you are looking at these models. But this is what we try to do, fade all these questions out, make a, a clear, a clean model. And this clear, clean model is based on the idea of an equilibrium. Equilibrium is one of the core concepts, if you want, in economics. You have different forces, you have different interests. We do not deny this in economics. We say, yes, of course there are different interests, and there are even different strengths, different powers accumulated on one side or the other. But the decisive thing is we come to an equilibrium because at some stage the one side will be pushed back by the other. Market demand is the core area where we, where we apply it. We say we supply something and we apply it, we, we supply it according to the demand. We won't produce more than there, are, there is asked. If everybody buys a Lamborghini, fine, we will produce Lamborghinis, en masse. If there are only 2% buying these cars, we only produce so many cars to supply the demand of these 2%. There is actually an interesting thing going on here in China now. I don't know all the details, but the shift to, to the consumption to convince people to consume potatoes instead of rice. For different reasons. The production of rice is apparently more complicated, more expensive, or whatsoever. Um, and potatoes do the same job. So try to convince people to use potatoes. You cannot simply do it and say, well, give them potatoes, just delete rice from the grocery shop, no, no rice in. So there is this process of convincing people, of, of course, supplying more potatoes, supplying potatoes for a lower price, and then people may change. So it's again a complex process how you deal with it. But the idea is, at some stage, it will come to a new equilibrium. There will be as many potatoes produced as can be sold. Because what happens, of course, as well, is if I supply more potatoes, more people will ask for it. If there are more people asking for potatoes, more people will produce it. Equilibrium. This is the idea. If less people buy potatoes for whatever reason, after a year, they don't like them, they need them, need them. Well, I don't know what, what can happen. Um, you will have a difference, a change in the production again. 
Ideal world, the paradise, equilibrium. But it means that we cut off everything that is outside of this demand and supply. And this means the emphasis on, is on this. We have the local market. Ideally, in economics, we, we use closed markets in the model. We cannot deal with open, so we cut something off, and then we say we deal with this local market only for potatoes and rice. Whatever happens to vegetable, to meat, to other things. We limit this, we relate this to each other, and that allows us actually to model an equilibrium. And there is this example I found from, uh, from, from science, from a process of thermo, uh, what is it, thermodynamic equilibrium, where we think, yes, we can easily figure out temperatures, how they are influenced by the temperature outside. We have this thermostat and that regulates the temperature. So you have a circle, equilibrium. If something changes here, it has an effect on this and it changes back. So it's getting colder. The heating is switched on. Then it's getting warmer. The message the thermometer gets is you don't have to heat as much anymore, so switch off the heating, then it's getting colder again, and on and off. But even this is not possible. You can build this model. But at the end of the day, the temperature depends as well on the temperature outside. So you can have it in the room, you can build this perfect model, you have this equilibrium, but only if you remain within this room. How can you do it? You can say, okay, build walls. You cannot build walls as thick as they would be needed to keep any mass massive change outside. If it's really, really cold outside, you need damp, big, thick walls to keep this up. So no windows, no nothing. And this is, of course, in economics even more relevant, where you have uh, foreign markets, where you have changes of raw material prices. This is something you cannot leave out of this model. And this means whenever you come across building models, Keep in mind that these models are limited in this way of fading out a large part of reality and putting something into a box which is artificially closed. It's not really closed. It's another contradiction of economics, if you want, trying to figure out where are we actually stuck with this model how far can we go with it, and how far can we understand the reality in terms of closing things off, cutting things off. I said in this one lecture at the end we have this emoticon and we, we, we just hug each other or do something nasty, and this closes kind of every communication. In reality, and this is something we have to cope with in economics, in reality, of course, it begins with emotions. It begins with this irrationality and not with emotion. So we'll see you later in the week. Thank you.